Today is a standalone message. I really enjoy standalone sermons, and the reason I do is because you just get, kind of get to really open your heart and hear the Lord say something especially to you. So I, I, and I love that. I love uh, spontaneous words from the Lord especially, but uh, I love what the Lord spoke to me about this, and I just pray that our hearts will be open today. It's my prayer that, that God will be able to speak to us as uh, he spoke to me this message today. So I want to read today, if, you, if I could, out of, book of, out of the book of Jonah, chapter 1. I'm going to read out of the Message Bible. I know uh, maybe some people are not as crazy about the Message Bible because it actually is a paraphrased version. But um, sometimes, sometimes uh, King Jimmy, uh, or excuse me, King James Version doesn't really grab, grab me that way because it's a four or five hundred year old language that we don't speak anymore. And sometimes it's a, it can be a negative to go to the scripture to hear what God wants to say to you for here right now and it be 500 years ago. Yeah, so I just want to encourage that to you. This, this stirs my heart though. And... Uh, In Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, One day long ago, God's word came to Jonah, Amittai's son. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh, preach to them. They're in a bad way, and I can't ignore it any longer. Jonah got up and went the other direction to Tarshish. Isn't that funny? (laughs) Anybody ever done that? The Lord told you one thing, and you did the other. (laughs) Everyone needs to be raising your hand. right? Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Every, yeah, that's all of us. Okay, so but Jonah got up and went the other direction to Tarshish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa, found a ship headed to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went on and went on board, joining those going to Tarshish, Mediterranean cruise, and as far away from God as he could get. See, I love this story. I love I love Bible stories anyway. I love the adventure side of of uh, of heroes of faith and. You know, as I got older and started reading the Bible for myself, I started realizing there was a whole lot of things about Bible heroes that my Sunday school teachers left out. They left out the bad parts. You know, they would tell the great, well, you know how it is. You know, they tell the great parts. You'd, you know, hear the great part about David killing Goliath, but you don't hear about him killing a man to take his wife. I mean, for real, that was King David. I mean, you don't hear that part very much. So it's like when you got older, you start hearing, wow, there's, there's, uh, uh I mean, you know, you, you start thinking, there are some really, I just, I mean, can I just say it? There are no, per- God doesn't use perfect people because there are none. God uses messed up people who are, will- who are willing. That's a good chance to shout somebody. <laughs> Pastor Janice has it on the front row here. Why? Because there's hope for you. There's hope for me. God uses messed up people. Yeah, he does. I mean, think about it. Peter was so prejudiced. I'm talking about St. Peter. He was so prejudiced against the Gentiles, he wouldn't go preach Jesus to them because they weren't Jews. Think about it. There's hope for us, y'all. There's hope for you. Don't discount somebody because you think, oh, they got so many problems. They can't. No, God likes to use people with problems. God had to tell Peter three times. You, do you remember the vision of the sheet coming down from heaven, all the manner of beasts on it? And God said, rise, kill, and eat. Peter says, whoo. I mean, in our version today, it would be, I rebuke you, Satan. You know, a little S. But I mean, I I rebuke you. Get off, you know, go away from me because I'm not going to eat anything unclean. God says, don't don't call what I've created common or unclean. So what is God saying to Peter? And and, hey, Peter didn't get it. God knew he wouldn't get it one time. So he gave him the same vision three times. So Peter was the best God had. Peter was the best he had. Hmm. Think about it. Samson. We heard so many great stories of Samson, but half of his problem was he had such a bad temper, it kept getting him into trouble. But God used him just like he was. God used, I mean, it's it's such a beautiful, anybody besides me, you ever feel sorry for God? God wanted to save Nineveh, a town of 120,000 people. Established, most most historians think it was established by a man named Nimrod, who was a manhunter actually killed men for sport. It, wicked guy started, and, and Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, or what, what we know as Syria today. And it was a, a big city for trade and for commerce and so many different things, and they had everything you could, you could want there. And when God told Jonah to go preach to Nineveh, he went the other direction. Mm. So number one, in my points today I want to share with you today, God loves lost people. God loves lost people. You think about it. Remember, Jesus said when the shepherd had 99 sheep, had 100 sheep, one got lost, he left 
all of the one. He left 99 there to go find what? The one that was lost. Jesus is looking for the one. When Adam and Eve messed up so bad in the Garden of Eden, what did God do? The Bible says he went looking for them. Went looking for them. God loves lost people. Matter of fact, the scripture says there was something about Jesus that was so attractive to sinners that they wanted to hang out with him. Scripture said sinners reclined in Jesus' presence. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and I, and I found out that, you know, somebody that was really close to God was the last place a sinner wanted to be. If somebody would have even stood and preached, if, hey, this is how you know whether or not you're like Jesus, if you're just like Jesus, because sinner people want to hang out with you. I'd have said, I bind you, Satan. That's a lie of the devil. I mean, I want to win. Love the devil. You know what I'm saying? You know, because it's like, because it's like, man, the closer you were to God, that means worldly people don't want to hang out with you. We had names for him, see, because it was a us, big us and them thing. And so, but I mean, God loves lost people. Would you, would you be surprised? Would you, would it surprise you to think that, that one of the reasons church people come together is because they want to hang out with people who look like they have it all together? Yeah, I've had actually people say to me, when they looked, when, when they saw some people in this congregation or in other congregations, they says, I don't want to go worship with people that look like they got problems. I want to have an illusion, at least that people that I worship with have it together. That's what they said to me about coming to church. Imagine that. No, but I'm, I'm telling you, there are people in this room right now that are, that some of us are just goofed up. We got dumb ideas. You got squirrely thoughts running around in your head right now. Yeah. You, you, you've already dis- you've, you are already past lunch and sleeping. <laughs> or you got, no, for real. But there are people in this room, we're, they're so goofed up. Marriages are goofed up. You need, account, you need marriage, count, marriage counseling right now. You need help. I mean, don't, don't nobody shout amen or nothing. But I mean... <laughs> You need help on so many different levels with relationships, families, and guess what? We're here because we need help. We're here because we know the answer. Mm. God loves lost people. Isaiah 30, verse 18 says this, yet the Lord waits for you to come to him so that he can show you his love. He will conquer you. What? Conquer me? Yeah. Remember in spiritual warfare series, we talked about there's a war that's going on inside of you. That if you don't surrender to the new nature from Jesus Christ, according to his word, that guess what? The old nature is going to take over you, Christian or not. You're going to be a Christian, but you're going to live like you're not one. Why? Because you're letting that nature, that lower nature inside of you, take rule. Look at this. God's waiting. The Lord still waits for you to come to him so he can show you his love. He will conquer you to bless you, just as he said, for the Lord is faithful to his promises. Helper Jesus. And, uh, Lord, and it says... <laughs> blessed are all those who wait for him to help them. How many are waiting for God to bless you? I've got both hands up. I'm waiting for God. There's some areas in my life I'm waiting for God. I'm waiting for God, and I know he's going to do it. I know he is. So, you know, <laughs> so I just want to encourage you today. If you've got a son or a daughter or a coworker, or a friend who's lost or they're running from God, God loves them way more than you could or that you do. Call them in. See them saved. See them healed. See them excited about Jesus. See, I mean, I mean let, me, let me just encourage you about something. Quit talking about how bad it is. Quit talking about how messed up they are. Start, talking about what you, start saying what you're believing God about them. Start getting in agreement with what God says about them. Don't quit talking about how bad somebody is or how bad. You need to quit giving your mouth authority to, to speak more, to get more of what you've already got. Scripture says the person who loves to talk will get the fruit of what they're saying. So get in, get in agreement with what God has already said about your situation. Mm. Or maybe here today you've got a dream that's dead. Maybe you have, a, you have a, a wish or a dream. A couple Sundays ago, I saw God gave me a vision during worship service, and I saw people, I saw somebody taking a box off of a top shelf. And when I saw him take it off, I heard the Lord say to me, this is a dream that someone's taken off the shelf that they put on there a long time ago because they didn't think that I could do it for them. And I'm helping, I'm bringing restoration to that dream for them today. 
and had a stranger, never been to church here before, after service said, I'm the one today that had that box. But I got news for you. It wasn't just him. It was others. And it may be you. Romans chapter 4, verse 17, that said, God gives life to the dead and calls those things into existence that did not exist before. So today, God's more than able to breathe life back into whatever you think is dead or gone or passed away. Point number two. Number one was God loves lost people. Number two, what does God have to do to get us ready to obey him? I know it's a question. may not sound like a point. But I want to draw special attention to what does God have to do. Let's look at Jonah. Like here it says in verse, verse uh, 4, it says, But God sent a huge storm. What? what? Look at it. God sent a huge storm at sea. The waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. Now think about it for a minute. Pastor Rod, hold on. What do you, what do you mean God sent a storm? This I like to call is a mercy storm. Well, why is it a mercy storm? Because the only God didn't have, it didn't have anything else that he created that would obey him. Only the waves. The man that he had that was hoping to preach a message uh, to, to, to help. Why, was the wa- why were the waves happening? Because there were 120,000 people over in Nineveh crying, crying out to know God. Who were dying and hopeless going into eternity without a chance to know God. And all God had that would do his bidding for him were waves. This is a mercy storm. God's trying to get a hold of Jonah so that he can get Jonah where he needs to be so that he can save people, help them, set them free. Think about it. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation to their gods. They threw everything they were carrying overboard to lighten the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship to take a nap. Jonah was sound asleep. The captain came to him and said, what's this? Sleeping? Get up. Pray to your God. Maybe your God will see the trouble we're in and rescue us. Mm. Think about it. You know, how many people do you think in our lives that need help, genuine help, where we work, people that we come in contact with, that are looking for somebody that has hope for them, that they can wake them up? And they're saying, please, wake up. Stop sleeping. Tell me about this Jesus that makes you smile. Tell me, tell me, give me hope for my marriage that's messed up. Give me hope for my future, my dreams that fell apart. Give me hope for my, for, for my, for my whole life, my dream. I used to have hope, used to have faith. And there's a world out there that's coming, that's, that's coming to believers wanting help, wanting hope. And what are we doing? I don't want to be sleeping, y'all. I don't want to be a person that's sleeping when there's people with needs around me needing help, and I've got everything they need on the inside of me. I don't want to be like Jonah, that I'm sleeping. I want to get away. Let's look a little further and see what Jonah, why he's doing this. Mm. Jonah chapter 1, verse 7, it says, The sailors said to one another, Let's get to the bottom of this. I love me some good sailors right here. Check it out. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's draw straws to identify the culprit on this ship who's responsible for this disaster. So they drew straws. Jonah got the short straw. Imagine that. All righty. Then they grilled him. Confess. Why is this disaster? What's your work? Where do you come from? What country? What family? Listen, listen. There are people who don't know Jesus, who don't know God, who will be coming up to you asking you what is different about you. Please tell me what is up with you. Mm. He told him, I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. <laughs> At that, the men were frightened, really frightened, and said, what on earth have you done? As Jonah talked, the sailors realized he was running away from God. And they said to him, what are, you go- what are we going to do with you to get rid of this storm? By this time, the sea was wild, totally out of control. Jonah said, throw me overboard into the sea. Then the storm will stop. It's all my fault. I'm the cause of the storm. Get rid of me. You'll get rid of the storm. But no. The men tried rowing back to shore. They made no headway. The storm only got worse and worse. Wild and raging, they prayed to God, Oh God, don't let us drown because of this man's life. And don't blame us for his death. You are God. Do what you think's best. And they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and immediately the sea was quieted down. Sailors were impressed, no longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of God. They worshiped God, offered a sacrifice, and made vows. Woo! Y'all, hold on just a minute. I don't want God to save people in spite of me. I mean, that's, that's okay. It's the best God had right then. 
That's the best God had right there. But I don't want to save God in spite of me. I want, I, I, I want, excuse me, I don't want God to save people in spite of me. I want to be with him. I want to work with him in reaching people. Jonah's got a message, and you'll see when he goes to Nineveh, it's not a long sermon. Preachers don't need to preach that long. Somebody say amen. amen. That's the only amen I'm going to get out of some people today. <laughs> Preachers don't really need to preach that long. They just need to say what God wants them to say. I mean, think about this. Here are, here are hardened sailors. Anybody know a hardened sailor? I mean, you ever heard the term cuss like a sailor? I mean, here they are. These are rough guys. And before it's over, when they throw Jonah in the water, the sea is totally calm, and they are worshiping God. The Bible says these tough and sailors are crying. They're worshiping God. They made vows to God. Whole lives turned around. Whoa, well, I didn't know who God was. I didn't know that this one this guy's talking about. But from now, he is the man. He's the one. He's the man. So the Bible says their whole life was turned around right then on the spot. Mm. I remember having, there was one day I, I preached a message here, and, and as, a, as this, uh, he was a Navy commander, and, uh, and <laughs> he's, he was a nuclear submarine commander, actually, and he's walking out the door. He grabbed my hands. He said, that's the best damn message, Pastor. And I said, <laughs> I said, thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. I was so excited, y'all. And, uh, and the next Sunday, I stood up here and just told everybody, yeah, I said it just like I did then. And I mean, I said it and, and, and I was, and later he came up to me, his face was blood red. He apologized. He said, he said, pastor, if I could kneel in front of you, he is a lifelong Catholic. He said, if I could kneel, I would. Here's the thing. I loved it. I told I said, I can't, but listen, I get so many churchies, church Christianese talks and religious com compliments. I said, I'm so glad to finally have one that's legit. And he was embarrassed because he realized the word damn came out of him without him even thinking because he wanted to compliment the message that was touching his heart. See, I'm telling you, God can't bless the fake you. He can only bless the real you. So if you're not being real, it's time for you to be real. You too, it got, listen, life's too precious to die a copy. Be you. Be the real you. Number three, mercy is God's greatest weapon for reaching somebody we hate. Well, excuse me, we're Christians, we don't hate anybody. So somebody that we're struggling with liking, God's mercy is the greatest weapon we have for reaching somebody that we struggle with loving. Jonah chapter 4. Now, I want to catch up to speed real quick. I gotta, we got to fast forward here because we only got a little bit of time left. But, but what's happened is, is Jonah, <laughs> you know, he got thrown over. God prepared a big fish. God, the fish swallowed him. Jonah cried out to God three days in the belly of the whale. God! I mean, you know, you can hear it. You're hearing me. God, you know, Jonah, ah! You know, he's, who's ever been on the inside of a well and lived? Nobody I know of. Stranger things. I mean, you know, I mean, it's like inside of the belly of the well. Ah! Let me, scripture says, I cried. Hey, y'all, parallel of Jesus. Jesus in the, in the heart of the earth, the Bible says, just like Jonah was in the belly of the well three days, three nights, so was Jesus in the heart of the earth, suffering eternal death for every person. I mean, y'all, this is incredible. Jonah's suffering. So this whale, I mean, after all those stomach juices and everything, I don't know, all over him, spits him out on dry ground. He comes and preaches a wild message to the people of Nineveh. Hey! 40 days he went all through the city. Nineveh's going to be destroyed. It's going to be destroyed. Repent, everybody, repent. What was Nineveh's situation? Y'all, they were worldly people. They had everything. They had all the things that life and money could buy, but they didn't know God. What did God say about them? God said they didn't even know their left hand from their right hand. What was God saying? Not that they didn't know right and left. God was saying no one had ever preached the truth to them before. No one had ever told them about God. And so when someone came and preached the message of repentance, their life turned around. Y'all, somebody's waiting for the message that only you can preach. There's, a, there's an audience in your life, and I'm not talking about in this room. There's an audience in your life that you have, you may not even know you have. And God wants to use you to preach just a little, sometimes it's just one word, it's just a few words, whatever it is. Listen, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to be, no, you know, I'm telling you, I don't know what your belly of the well experience was. I don't know what God's brought you out of. But I'm telling you, look at what happened to Jonah. He missed it. Jonah was furious, chapter 4. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it. 
when I was back at home. I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angry, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a plan, program of forgiveness. So God, if you would, no won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, what, what? What do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out to the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. Why? Jonah was more concerned about him being the prophet and what he's saying come to pass. Because now God was going to forgive him and him as a prophet, what he says is not coming to pass. So they're going to think I'm a false prophet. What have I, what, what, what have I got used to live? I don't, I don't have no reason to live now. I ain't no prophet. I'm a false prophet because I know that's the whole reason I didn't come here to God because you were going to forgive, forgive, forgive. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Grace, grace, grace. Don't you love it? That's the same way religious people talk about people who preach the love of God and grace. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Grace, grace, grace. You know why? Because people, there's Christian people that actually think God needs to get mean with people before they turn around. When it's the mercy, grace, and love of God that causes people to turn around. God's sitting here trying to tell Jonah this. But guess what? Jonah forgot you were just in the belly of a well for three days and three nights. No hope. No hope. And the whale was mercy. It was a big old floating mercy thing running around. Because what was your, the only other thing you got was drowning in the, in the bottom of the ocean. And God prepared a fish to rescue you. What did you do? Cried out in the belly of the whale. God set you free. You spit you out on dry ground so that you could go preach the message of the gospel. And then when you're preaching the gospel to Nineveh, you forget got what God did for you. Thank God that we would forget what God has done for us. Rick Warren said God's mercy to us is the motivation for showing mercy to others. Remember, you will never be asked to forgive someone else more than God has already forgiven you. Would you bow your heads with me? Are you here today? I'm asking you by the Spirit of God, where's your Nineveh? Where's the people God has called you to that you've, had, you, that, that you've developed a hard heart toward? You said, I'm not the one. I just can't do it. I don't have anything for him. And God's not saying to you that about what you have. God's saying, look at what I've done for you. Look at how I've turned your life around. Look where you would be today if I hadn't rescued you. Where's your Nineveh? Where is the place you hold a word in your heart that only you can share. Where is your Nineveh? Have you, have you limited God? Have you said, no, I, I don't even like these people. I can't stand them. I've even quit praying for them. They're too hard-headed. They're too rebellious. I've given up hope. God says, I'm able. My mercy hasn't given up on them. I'm able. My mercy is my greatest weapon for you. My mercy is my greatest weapon for you. Look what I did for you. Look what I want to do for them. Let me pray over you, Father, in Jesus' name. Every person in this room. Father, I pray that a, a, that a reigniting of your grace and your mercy would rise up on the inside of them, that they would understand the greatest weapon that they possess on this planet is they are a walking container of the mercy of God. King David said, where would I be had not the Lord been on my side? I would have given up hope. I would have fainted unless I would have believed to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for your mercy to baptize us fresh today. Your grace, your love to waken us up to your goodness so that we can offer hope to a world around us that's saying, please wake up. Please tell me what is the source of your strength. Where, who are you? Tell me who, tell me who are you. Tell me what you're about. Who's God? Who is your God? So we can maybe pray to him and get, and get some hope for my life. Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Stir us, stir our hearts today. Wake us up. If you're here today and maybe for the first time in your life, can I invite you to ask Christ to be Lord of your life? Maybe you've never invited Christ to be Lord of your life. Maybe you've heard about Jesus. Maybe you've been around family that do, but maybe you've never invited. I want to give you this opportunity to pray this simple prayer with us and accept a reality on the inside of you that can, will take the old you and make you brand new. The greatest demonstration of love in all of the universe when the God of heaven bankrupt heaven and gave his most precious prize gift and that was his son Jesus so that a fallen world could know him. And The message of the simple gospel today is God is at peace with mankind. And 
you must you need to accept him to experience that relationship if you're here today and you've never invited christ to be lord of your life would you pray this prayer with us as your family let's everybody pray together let's pray along everybody say father thank you for giving jesus thank you jesus for dying on the cross for me and rising again i repent of my sins jesus you are my lord 